Good evening, everyone. We're so excited to welcome you to a Meet the Author virtual event. We're going to be speaking with Denise Williams shortly, but first, a few announcements. I'm Rachel. I'm the Adult Outreach and Event Coordinator for the Greenville County Library System. I'm so happy to welcome you here this evening. If you haven't already, please do think about signing up for Winter Reading. This is a special event for adults. Kids can't have all the fun. Um, this has started in January, but it goes all the way through March 15th. So you've still got some time to complete. There's a bingo board in there where you just have to complete challenges and complete one row, any direction, and you earn some great completion prizes from our sponsors at Swamp Rabbit Cafe and Grocery, Swamp Rabbit Hockey, Plus Plus, and Roper Mountain Science Center grand prizes. Uh, you have an entry into grand prizes as soon as you finish one of the rows as well. So please do sign up for that at greenvillelibrary.org slash winter reading. You can pick up one of those fantastic activity booklets at any physical location, or you can just download one easily from home. If you'd like to check out more events like this one, do think about following us on social media. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also always check out greenvillelibrary.org slash events. That way you can see what events are coming up on the horizon. You can register for virtual events or any other events and make sure that you don't miss out on our fantastic Meet the Author events. We've got another one coming up very soon, just next week. So you don't wanna miss out on that. That's gonna be with Deb Richardson Moore. That one's in person. And then we have another one with Ann B. Ross. Um, and that one is about um, Miss Julia series. That one is going to be a virtual event, just like this one. If you're watching our recording, you can watch any other Meet the Author events by checking out the other videos on this playlist. So now I'd like to welcome Denise Williams. We're so excited for her to come speak to us today. If you are a romance fan, you are in the right spot. I'm just going to read off her bio very quickly. And I do have to say, this is one of the best author bios we've ever seen. So very excited to have her here. Denise Williams wrote her first book in the second grade, I Hate You, and its sequel, I Still Hate You, featuring a tough, funny heroine, a quirky hero, witty banter, and a dragon. Minus the dragons, these are still the books she likes to write. After penning those early works, she finished second grade and eventually earned a PhD. After growing up a military brat around the world and across the country, Denise now lives in Iowa with her husband, son, and two ornery shih tzus who think they own the house. How to Fail at Flirting was her debut novel, and she can usually be found reading, writing, or thinking about love stories. Be sure to check out her books and more information about her at denisewilliamswrites.com. So welcome, Denise, welcome to your virtual visit with Greenville. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I shared in our little pre-chat that there's like three inches of snow outside my window. So it is amazing to be virtually somewhere a little bit warmer. So excited to be with you all tonight. I um, was asked to talk a little bit about kind of my journey to writing and my books. Um, and I'll try to be as funny as I can because I usually do and I usually fail, but that's okay because your cameras are off and I'm just going to assume you're laughing. Um, and then we'll have some time for Q&A. So please make use of the chat chat. I will try to keep an eye on it, but I'm sure other folks will be um, looking at that as well. So if there's questions, drop them in there or comments, or if you just want to share, that would be great. So I'll go ahead and just share my um, screen real quick and talk a little bit about kind of um, my journey. So yep, that's me. You may be wondering how I got here. I just joined TikTok and that's one of the audios that always makes me smile. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey to writing and I don't know if we have any authors or aspiring authors or folks who just love to write but aren't comfortable calling themselves authors yet. Uh, drop that in the chat. I'd love to know kind of who's here um, to talk about my writing process. I'll talk about my books but also like wonderful books that I'm reading and that are coming up one of the coolest things as an author is you get to read books early and then talk about them and spread buzz and as a reader and also a nerd that is just like the coolest thing ever to me and so um we'll be happy to talk about some cool books that I'm reading and then again to take your questions and so um to hear what you have to say so uh, I am Denise Williams I use she her pronouns I live in Iowa and in my my day job, I work as a university administrator um, and then the mom to a very rambunctious five-year-old on top of writing romance novels. So all of those have some kind of very different 
roles in my life, but I really like how they come together. Um, and my debut novel was How to Fill Out Flirting. And uh, the picture here is from its first birthday in December, the, the large print version, the UK version and the US version. And then it's coming in Turkish at some point. I don't speak or read Turkish. I have one friend who does. So that is the sole friend I'm going to send a copy to and see how the translation looks. Um, and then The Fastest Way to Fall, which came out in November. And uh, this is the UK cover and the US cover and the um, large print just came out a couple days ago, so I don't have a copy of that yet. And then I have four novels coming soon, so I'll talk about those in a little bit. But a little bit about my um, journey to writing. So I Hate You and I Still Hate You were the first books I ever wrote. It was a school project in the second grade and they had us bind them. So they, they're my first hardcover books too. Um, and I just remember holding that little like class project and thinking I made this and this might be the best story ever told. Like I've had a lot of humility even as a child um, and I still have those books somewhere, but I do remember that feeling of just thinking like I made this, I created this and falling in love with those characters and with that dragon and with these this prank war that these two children had. And the same thing for the sequel, which you know I had to wait a while to write. I think it came out about six hours later. Um, and that was the first books, like that was my journey, but I've always loved to tell stories I've always loved to write. And a year later, I wrote my first play. It is three pages long. It has seven acts. It has 22 characters. And I made all the neighborhood children um, act it out. And I found that recently and some colleagues read it out too. And so, you know, as I'm thinking about like journey, I just think about those kind of childhood moments of writing. And now that I'm a parent, thinking about how I really love to foster that with my son and like, go with his creativity and so when he wants to act out um a spin jitsu play i don't know what that is but we just acted it out downstairs before i came up here um that we do that and i think that's so important as we think about how we grow and learn and like where our creativity is is nurtured so moving forward a little bit, I got very into Fear Street. I don't know if anybody else was into R.L. Stein and Fear Street as a kid, um, like own it, drop it in the chat. I had them all and I thought I could write that. And so I wrote something called Ding Dong Ditch and Die. I dug this out again. It was like nine pages long, 17 chapters, seven murders. Um, and it was all about uh, doing the game like Ding Dong Ditch. I spoke to a group of middle schoolers about writing um, not that long ago. And so I pulled that out to kind of show them like, this is where I started. This is what I was writing when I was in your shoes. Um, and so that was kind of fun. And also like learning, even in that, I'm going back and read it. It's not good, but I did. That's where I first started playing with like maybe some darker themes and looking how um, that kind of shapes our humor and how we interact with other people, which comes up in my novels actually a lot. Skipping forward to that, I thought I was very deep as a high school student and I wrote a lot of very awful poetry, including one poem where I compared grief to a thermos of green jello, which is wrong on so many levels. Number one, you don't eat jello out of a thermos and it, it makes no sense. Um, uh, several years ago, I actually discovered that those poems were still on the internet from 1998. Uh, didn't look like the website had been updated since then, but I got to reread some of those um, and kind of see my journey as a writer. A couple of them were pretty good and I don't think I got through the green jello one without just crying and laughter. I wrote my first not real novel, novella really, in 2007. It was National Novel Writing Month. And if anybody has participated in NaNoWriMo, um, drop that in the chat. That's where you write a 50,000 word book in a month. Um, and that's actually how I wrote my second novel was during NaNoWriMo. But this was my first attempt and it was a beautiful story that will never see the light of day because it's horrible. Uh, but it was about adult children coming home um, when their, their mother dies unexpectedly. And you see kind of how their relationships come together and how they are with each other. And that was the first time I really thought about writing something that other people might read. Um, I didn't really think about publishing it. I didn't think anything about that, but you know, I did think other people could read this story and I could make these characters come to life. And it was going back to that first moment of writing that the first of I hate you book of falling in complete love with my characters and dreaming about them and thinking about them in my downtime and being so excited to leave work so I could go and like be with these characters again. And that is completely how I feel now when I get into writing um, one of my novels or one of my novellas is I know I'm writing the right thing when I fall in love with the characters. 
So skipping ahead uh, and switching, uh, doing quite a big 180 is boots on the ground, examining the transition factors for military and veteran student academic success. That was my dissertation when I earned my PhD. And so um, for a very long time, I didn't write anything that didn't have to do with my PhD in education. And I studied um, student veterans and their transitions to college. There was a lot of statistics involved. And I was very deep into my research, into my academic writing, and there really wasn't time for fiction. Even like my, re even I read very little fiction in that whole five, six year period as I was working on my PhD. But it it's published. It's my first book. I think seven people have read it in total because we get our library stats every month, um, which is sad. But it's interesting to kind of look at that as my really formal writing training was in academia. And after that, I had a kid. And I jokingly wrote that the title here was Pumping on My Lunch Break. Kid, you better appreciate this later. That wasn't so much a book as it was a Facebook rant, but I think it counts because I wrote it very often and very ardently. Um, and then I got to this point leading up to all of this where I was buried in my research. I was buried in momming. I was having all these things going on. It was 2016 and the world was the world of 2016. And I sat down one night and just thought, I wonder if I could write a romance novel. And I was like, I don't have time for that. Let me write a romance short story. And that's where How to Fail at Flirting, which was my debut novel, started. And so I, I sat down and thought, you know, let me just write this cute, fun little story about exes, about ex-boyfriends, and how they shape us in the long run. And so I sat down at the computer and opened Word and was just going to write a short story like I'd done a thousand times before. And it felt great. Um, and I don't know if this is everybody's experience as a new parent, but definitely it was for me. I felt like in some ways I'd lost touch with myself. Um, I, lo I love being with my son and I, I wasn't um, going through anything like depression or anything like that, but I just felt like everything in me was devoted to this little person and my family and my work. And there wasn't any left just for me. And so when I sat down at the computer to write, it was just for me and it was lovely and I felt good about myself. And so the next night um, when he went to bed, I've always been blessed with a good sleeper. Um, I wrote again and then again and again and again. And eventually I had a book and I thought, wow, this is really good. And I sent it to my friends and they kindly and gently and lovingly told me it was not good. Um, but I went back, edited it. Um, I learned some more about fiction writing and, you know, tried to take some of that academic voice out of it. And I joined a writer group and I started reading craft books. And then I sent it out to my friends. I was like, okay, well now it's good. And those writer friends less gently and less lovingly informed me that it no was not that good yet. Um, but writing is very iterative. I kept editing um, and eventually it was good. And then, um, just kind of the, the process of going from writing a book to publishing a book is uh, many times you need to find a literary agent, which if you're not familiar is a lot like an agent, like in Hollywood, like they represent you and they, um, you know, they kind of fall in love with your book and then they sell it to publishers. And that process is humbling um, on the best of days because it's mostly filled with rejection. Uh, but I was very lucky to find a literary agent fairly quickly who loved my book and I love her style and then to connect with a publisher. But again, it was kind of this whirlwind of I never planned to be an author. My formal training is not in writing fiction. And this was really something I fell into backwards because it felt good. And I think that's true for so many of us. Like we find something that we love and then just allowing ourselves to do it. And sometimes it pays us not much, as an educator and a writer, I could have chose hobbies that paid more, but um, maybe you have a like side hustle in computer programming, which would be much more lucrative. Um, so that's kind of how I got from that place of ding dong ditch and die and a thermos full of green jello floating in the ocean to you know having books on the shelf. And I'll talk a little bit more about kind of specific writing process, but for me that was that was kind of the journey, and it was accidental and still many steps along the way feel accidental, but I've kind of learned that to trust that feeling of, I feel whole when I'm doing this, I feel whole when I'm writing. And so I keep, keep writing. Um, and so that has been really, for me, very fulfilling. So these are some questions I get sometimes about writing process. And 
Um, again, some of these I have like very kind of specific processes about for a lot of these, it kind of depends on the story, but again, I'll kind of talk through this and folks are sometimes interesting in how interested in how kind of the books come to be. And so, um, folks will ask often, you know, do you think about the characters or the, the kind of plot or the premise first? And for all of my books, that's actually been a little bit different. So with my um, debut, which was uh, How to Fail at Flirting, as I've mentioned already, I didn't know what I was doing. So the plot did not come first. Um, the character came first. The main character is, is Dr. Naya Turner. She is a professor. She is a domestic violence survivor. She um, is kind of a closed off person. I knew a lot about her and in many ways her story is mine, in many ways it's not. But I knew that character from the get-go, even when it was a silly story just about ex-boyfriends um, and it was gonna be this kind of little funny short thing that I wrote, I knew that was my central character. And there were a variety of reasons, um, the things I share in common with her, but also at the time there was a lot of vitriol about higher education, about universities, about who professors were and, and what they did. And I really wanted to show a professor as human because yeah, and I, something I tell my students all the time is when you earn a doctorate, they don't like give you cool points. At that point, they take them away. Um, and so, you know, professors are human and they have all these different things going on just like everybody else. And so I knew I wanted to show that and write that character. And I also wanted to make sure she was a person of color as a character. And so she's a multiracial person. But in that story, the character definitely came first. And the plot came in thinking about, you know, what would be a foil to her? What would be her happily ever after? Her love interest, who would be this perfect complement for her? Um, and I love him all on his own. Like he can come to real life at any point, which many of my heroes can for me. But um, she was she was first. She was the core person. And I think that that's probably pretty clear in the book because it's all from her point of view. Um, and it's a love story, but you still get to see a lot of her growth and her healing. With the second book, um, The Fastest Way to Fall, which came out in November, um, the hero actually came to me first. And so um, I wrote Wes, who is a personal trainer and who has had these different family things. He was in my head first. And I knew it would be a story about exercise. And I knew the heroine would be a fat woman. And I knew some of those things. But the character I fell in love with, the character I knew first um, was Wes. And if you've read the book, something that might be kind of funny, because I think a lot of people love the heroine, Britta. Um, they really connect with her and on so many levels, and I love her as well. Um, in my first draft, those same friends who are so kind and gentle and lovingly honest handed it back and were like, this is great. We love the story. Um, Wes is amazing. Britta is a robot. <laughs> I was like, what? No way. She's so awesome. And then I reread it and I was like, oh yeah, I got really into writing the hero, writing Wes. I knew him. I knew him so well. I forgot to give her a personality or like friends or like a life. Um, and so this is why your readers are so helpful. Um, but went back and changed some of that. But for those two stories, like the character was hundred percent first. With um, my next novel, which will be out in September, it's about a um, divorce attorney who performs weddings and a dude bro wedding planner, and neither of them believe in love and it's enemies to lovers. I had so much fun writing this story, but that one, the premise 100% came first because I'm actually ordained to perform weddings. I think I've performed eight or nine. I've done my brother's weddings and, and several of my um, cousins and family and friends. And it's just something that I think is really fun to do for people. And I mentioned that to my agent when we were having lunch, um, the only time we were ever able to meet in person in New York. And she said, oh, that would be a great start for a romance novel. And I was like, wait a minute, it would. And I went home and I wrote the first chapter. I went back to my hotel and wrote the first chapter. And so with that one, I didn't know the plot. I didn't know the characters. I just knew that would be the setup. Um, this, uh, uh, I knew it was going to be a divorce attorney who performed weddings and this mix of being surrounded by love all the time and actually not believing in romantic love yourself and then finding this kind of perfect complement. And then for some others, the premise has kind of come first. So some authors are very set like in what they look at first and how they outline. For me, it's, it's a little bit more organic of kind of just what I'm feeling and what I'm falling in love with. And it's a little easier, I think, when you start with the premise and the plot because then you know what's gonna happen. Um, for me, when I start with the characters, I fall in love with the characters, but I don't know what they're going to do. Uh, and so that takes a little longer to figure it out, but um, that kind of leads into that next bullet, which is, you know, do I plan these stories or do I kind of just go by the seat of my pants? And I like to call myself a plotster. 
which I think is better than a pant. I guess pantsters may be better, but, uh, or um, plant, plant, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, but I usually, I have all the tools. I love spreadsheets. It's my home is a spreadsheet and I love to like map it all out till about 50% of the book. And then I get bored and then I go and I start writing until I've gotten to 70% of the book. And I realize I don't know how it's going to end. And then I kind of have to backtrack. So I like to do a little bit of planning on the front end, but once I get into the story, I really like for the characters to kind of guide me. Um, and if I have a general roadmap, in my writing, um, then I, I kind of like to figure it out as I go. And usually the, the plan changes even from that early pre-writing that I did and that early plotting, just because I get to know the characters, I kind of learn things about them. I get new ideas about, you know, what might be a foil to them or what might be a new hurdle for them. And then it kind of changes the story, um, which means I overwrite a lot. So um, for How to Felt Flirting, I think I cut 22,000 words out of that between um, my agent signing me and us selling the book. Um, and then it changed quite a bit from there with uh, The Fastest Way to Fall. I think this ended, actually, I don't think, I know this ended at 99,989 words. And I know that because they told me I had to keep it under 100,000. <laughs> and it was very much like, hmm, where can I make a contraction? Like, where can I make a, something hyphenated? Like it was down to the nitty gritty. But that book used to be like 120,000 words. So that is a fairly inefficient way to write. Um, but for me, sometimes I have to tell myself more of the story than kind of what you need to read, which does lead to a lot of great cut scenes. Like in How to Fail at Flirting, there is an entire love scene comprised of Star Wars puns. Fairly certain we wouldn't have been able to publish that anyway, uh, but I love it. Maybe someday I'll release it on my newsletter or something because it's, it's pretty explicit too. Um, so you get into the Star Wars, but that's a little bit of kind of how I go about crafting the stories is, you know, a little bit planning, a little bit creativity and seeing what happens um, and a little bit of kind of just letting the chips fall where they may. So uh, I mentioned on here, um, beta readers and sensitivity readers, and this is really important, I think, for most writers and in most processes, and I've always used them liberally. Um, your alpha readers are kind of the people you send it to first. For me, that's usually my, my best writer friends, the first people who are going to read it. It might not even be done yet, and they give me that initial feedback, not like, you need to fix the plot here, or this is inconsistent, but more like, I love the story, I'm feeling it, or, you know, this isn't romantic, or this was very sexy, or I couldn't read this on the bus or whatever it was, um, you know, like they're giving you that initial feedback and that's really helpful. But your beta readers are folks who maybe know a little bit more about either the content area or the writing. And so for the fastest way to fall, I had a huge number of beta readers who represented different folks. And so I had my core group of, of romance authors who I go to, who I write with, whose styles I really like. And they were, you know, they gave me feedback on the pacing and the plotting and, you know, more like technical things. But I also had a whole other group of people I sent it to who would have known experiences like the character did. And so um, I put out a call to my friends who identify as fat women, for folks who um, are runners, to people who grew up around addiction, all things that, that the characters go through. And I asked them to read it. And I still was interested in their thoughts on, you know, anything. But really, I wanted to know where did this hit home for you? And where did it feel off? And when you think about, you know, seeing your own experiences in a book, it really is a balance of, hey, that, that, that was my experience. And even when you're writing a book, you know, this is how it was for me, but it's going to be very different for somebody else. So I like to get a lot of voices, particularly with this book, because I knew I was going to write a story about a fat woman and it was going to deal with exercise. And that can be such a, a tenuous line to walk to make sure that it's body positive, but that it's meaningful, but that it's real, but that it's still funny and romantic. And so like beta readers and then later my sensitivity readers were so helpful in helping me see where I was hitting the mark. But they also, what I thought was interesting with this book is I actually learned a lot about myself. And I think I learned more about the topic. I think I have a, a pretty strong sense of self. I'm a fairly confident person, I'm really confident in my body. Um, but a lot like the main character, I have my moments of self-doubt. But you know, we've all been conditioned by all these outside voices around us about so many things in our lives, um, including like bodies and health and weight and all of that. 
And some of that made its way into my writing in ways I didn't even notice. And I study this kind of stuff, like for, that's my job, like my day job, I study this kind of thing, um, like implicit bias. But there is a scene in the book, if you've read it, where the heroine stands in front of a mirror and she's a little drunk and she's in her underwear and she's like, I, I'm going to do a self-assessment before the internet does it for me because she's about to go online and, and post this. And initially in that, it was a really strong mix of, I like this about my body. I don't like this about my body. And a friend read it and she's like, well, why does she need to point out things she doesn't like? And initially I was like, well, of course she would point out things she doesn't like. And then I thought, well, would she? Does she have to? Um, and so I rewrote that scene to it really is more her being positive about her body. And it was just that little moment of aha that no, we don't have to be critical about this. And as an author, I can write this person who has this experience, even if I have not had that experience. And so I think as an author, that's been kind of a cool thing too, to kind of learn things about my own wellness, about my own experience as I was writing these characters and doing research and, and learning from other people. Um, the character also runs a 5K. I did not do that. I ate Cheetos while I wrote about it and I was very comfortable with that too. Um, so I am happy to answer questions about that as we keep going. Um, killing your darlings and editing. I mentioned already, I am an overwriter um, almost always. And so I always have to cut scenes that I really love. Um, but the other thing I've learned too is if I'm having a lot of trouble writing a scene, it usually is gonna be cut later um, because it's the wrong thing. Um, I have some books coming out this spring and one of them is, it's actually my favorite book that'll be coming out this year F4, um, but it's working title was Garbage Book because I was starting it in the wrong place. I was trying to write the wrong things and it was so difficult to write and I didn't love it until I stopped and I stepped back and realized I was writing the wrong thing um, and I had to change it up a little bit. It's now called The Sweetest Connection. My editor has informed me I should stop calling it Garbage Book, um, but that's kind of what it will always be in my heart, but it actually is my favorite of all three. Um, this last one that I'll touch on before I kind of um, move on, and again, feel free to kind of drop in questions if you have them, is I get asked a lot, you know, you, you write, you work full time, you have a child. I also run a women's empowerment program with a friend of mine. Um, I perform weddings on the side, I do photography on the side, I do a lot of things. And so I get asked often about like, how do you find time and how do you balance things? And I think the best advice that I ever got, and it was not in a writing context, I don't actually remember who said it. But it was when you're juggling a lot, it's just important to know which balls are plastic and which are glass because something's going to fall because that's just the nature of things. And so it's important, you know, at any given time, think through what can you drop and it's going to be fine. And then what might break if you drop it. And something I share too is that sometimes your kids are plastic. Like if I, you know, if I can't spend, not like literally, I'm not going to drop them on the floor, but you know, sometimes me playing Candyland with my child is not the most important thing that needs to happen. And he's going to be fine um, if I go and, and do this, this work thing that I need to do. But sometimes that is the most critical thing. And the same thing for books. Um, I have a book that's due in July that I should be writing tonight. I'm probably not going to write tonight. I'm going to go play Candyland with my kid because um, I was, you know, doing this now and then doing some other work things earlier. Um, and, and so in all things, I really do try to remember, you know, what's plastic and what's glass and if you drop something glass, you sweep it up and figure out how to move on. But that really was the best metaphor I ever saw because I think balance is a myth. It doesn't exist. It's really just figuring out what we're juggling at any given time. And I suspect most of the people on this call kind of know that for themselves too. I have the highs and lows of publishing a book. Um, if you have questions about that, I'm happy to answer. But um, just for the sake of time, I'll kind of skip over that and just say that there are many highs and some many dizzying lows. And I'll just leave it at that little bit of mystery. Um, so I maybe do this a little backwards, but to talk a little bit about my books, two of them are already out. Um, and I think probably in the, in the library that you could check out in ebook, audiobook, and they also have the, the UK in the large, large print version, which is great. Um, I love both of the audiobooks for how to fail flirting and the fastest way to fall. I am a huge audiobook nerd. And so, um, I commute 45 minutes each way every day. And so audiobooks are do I, how, how I do a ton of my reading. And so actually listening to both of those for me was more of an aha, I'm an author moment than holding the physical book. Like that was cool too. Um, but listening to the narrators, like bring my words to life was like just otherworldly. It's still my favorite part of the process. 
Um, and with actually with, with both of the books, I haven't physically read them since they were published. I haven't opened them other than to sign them, but I've listened to the audiobooks several times. Um, and so the narrators for that, it's January Lavoy narrated um, How to Fail at Flirting, who is actually a professor herself um, in Atlanta. I think she's at Emory. And then um, and Jami Camera and Teddy Hamilton narrated The Fastest Way to Fall. And I think I've had an audio crush on Teddy Hamilton for like a decade. So that was a little otherworldly. Um, I already talked about Do You Take This Man, which is the Enemies to Lovers book. That's the book I wrote during um, the kind of quarantine part of, of the pandemic. And I'll be very candid that I wrote all the sex scenes first and there's like nine of them. Um, and then I figured out the plot and I love the plot and I love those characters, but um, I it's very steamy. I wrote a lot of steamy scenes. And then in editing, I was supposed to cut one out and I ended up adding one to the epilogue. So um, that's coming soon if you're a fan of steamy books. And then um, I have the three digital books across the bottom. So, kind of fell backwards into this idea too, but late last year, um, late in 2020, late in, early in 2021, um, my publisher approached me if I wanted to write some novellas and they initially wanted them maybe a little bit lower heat, kind of light, kind of fun for the summer. And so the premise I came up with was love at the airport. And I've loved airports my whole life. And every time I fly, I actually think I'm going to run into my ex-boyfriend. I have like no ill will and I have no deep desire to see this person again. But I just always think I'm going to have that like amazing movie meeting moment um, with somebody from my past in an airport. It has yet to really happen, at least not with anybody I wanted to see. Um, but I love the idea of airports and of traveling and of all these stories coalescing in one place. And so this series of stories all takes place in and around the airport. The Love Connection will be out in audiobook in April and ebook in May. And that is about an airport dog groomer who has um, what I call a Diet Coke break. If you remember that old commercial from the 90s um, where the, the group of people in an office is scoping out the hot construction worker uh, while he drinks Diet Coke. And then they're all um, like staring and ogling and catcalling him. It's like super sexual harassy, but... Uh, it's a cultural reference, cultural touchdown. So uh, the, the airport dog groomer meets this frequent flyer who she's kind of been crushing on um, in the airport. And it turns out he's a romance author in need of a muse. And so they have this kind of fake dating um, experience inside the airport. And it was a lot of fun thinking of the dates you could have during a layover in the Atlanta airport. Um, so uh, they have pretzels on the people mover. They do a train ride up and down. They have a picnic at an abandoned gate. Um, and so that was a lot of fun to write. You kind of see how they come together. And that story also deals a lot with um, risk taking and being risk averse versus um, you know, risk aligned and what it looks like to take a risk on ourselves, which I think is one of the hardest things to do sometimes. Um, the second book, The Missed Connection, is about two chemistry professors who have a kind of sweet um, serendipitous night, uh, New Year's Eve, when they're both stuck in an airport and they share a kiss and it's this very sweet romantic moment and then they go their separate ways only to learn a few months later that they're actually academic rivals um, who've been trying to tear each other down professionally for years and who now have to travel on a five city tour together. So this one is, is Rivals to Lovers. It is so much fun. I had just a blast writing this kind of grumpy sunshine story. Um, in my head, he looks like Jesse Williams. She looks kind of like Lizzo, if that gives you kind of a picture. Uh, but that one will be coming out in May and June. And um, this was also... Um, what was I gonna say? Nope, lost it. So uh, this one's kind of, it's they're funny and kind of sweet and a little steamy this one, um, but it was really just a lot of fun to look at these characters and how they would kind of butt heads and to have it set in that academic space um, with this very sunshiny character and a very kind of serious, severe character and how they would get along. And then the last one, The Sweetest Connection, AKA Garbage Book, um, is about two best friends, Silas and Tegan, who uh, both work in an airport. And one thing that I love about this, I hope other people love it, no one's really read it yet, um, but they meet in college on a Zoom call. And so the first thing he ever says to her is, hey, I think you're on mute, which just kind of makes me chuckle because I don't know, I feel like that's the meet cute of our day. 
And so um, they find a missing love letter, like a lost love letter in the airport. And they figure out it's between two people that work there. And they've got five days to figure out who the love letter belongs to before she leaves the country. And this was a lot of fun to write a friends to lovers story. It's a very soft story. They there isn't like a third act breakup. And so it's like a very kind of gentle story. It's also very, very steamy um, toward the end. So they get into some stuff with some whipped cream. Um, but along the way, you're in this candy store, which is where she works, and kind of seeing the airport and seeing all of these different people who work there. And it kind of wraps up all three of the stories because they all take place in the same airport. So that's kind of what I have coming up, like all four of those, uh, Do You Take This Man and the three novellas will all be out this year in 2022. Um, so it's going to be kind of a busy spring and a busy fall, but that is exciting. And it has been a lot of fun to kind of get in the world of all of these stories and to write something that was a little bit different than my first novels. It's a little bit lighter, a little bit steamier, or, you know, has a different setting and some new characters. And as an author, yeah, that's that's a lot of fun because now I'm back to writing some of the novels that are um, a little bit closer to The Fastest Way to Fall and Do You Take This Man? Ooh, okay, I'm talking a lot. I'm gonna be quiet here in just a minute to take some questions. Um, but if you wanna find me, I am usually on social media, probably when I should be writing. Um, I'm really active on Instagram, on Twitter. I'm attempting TikTok. I think my videos are mostly sad because I'm too old for the platform, but I'm still having fun on it. Um, I'm over on Facebook and actually like two hours ago, I just started a, um, a readers group. Um, so the Juicy Readers. So if you want to join that, um, you can link to it through my website or through any of my other social, um, or you can search it or through my social platforms. And then I have my website here along with the QR code for that. And I think that's gonna be dropped in the chat too. Um, on my website, I have a few things that might be interesting for folks. I do have content warnings for um, my first two novels. There really aren't much to give for content warnings for the others that are out this year, but definitely for the first two, they're there. Um, particularly How to Fail Flirting has quite a bit of heavier content as the heroine is a survivor of domestic violence. Um, I also have some extra freebies, like some cocktail recipes. There's um, some book club kits in there. I have jigsaw puzzles, um, like online jigsaw puzzles for each of my book covers. And you think that's going to be easy. It is actually really hard. Uh, so if you're still in the space of wanting to do a puzzle, I've got those there. Um, and a few other goodies and kind of just information. So um, feel free to check things out there if you're curious. And then I'm going to take a sip of my beverage and kind of open things up for um, Q&A, Rachel, unless there's anything I kind of forgot before we open it up. No, you've touched on everything so well. Um, I do have to say you are great on TikTok. We all love watching you on TikTok. So oh, you. you are not too old for that platform. <laughs> yes, the uh, link to her website is in the chat. So you can click right on it right now if you'd like to. Um, so feel free to purchase some books too. I have checked out her website all the way. I do love the extra goodies. So I do recommend that you go searching through there. Um, that's fantastic. And, oh, and I should share if you, um, well, whether or not you've read them, but there is uh, bonus content for both the books. So it's tied to my newsletter, which there's a link to it on my website, but it's a bonus epilogue for how to fail at flirting. So you get to see a little, a little, proposal in the works and then the one for the fastest way to fall is pretty uh steamy content it has to do with like boudoir photography so those are both linked to my um, newsletter if you want just a little more reading it's no angst it's all just more happily ever after but a little more time with the characters love that <laughs> thank you also if you do um live close to the libraries if you purchase some of our books um, tonight or watching this recording, let me know. Um, Denise has kindly offered to send some signed book plates, um, so be sure to let us know. <laughs> All right, we have some, we already have some questions in the chat, so okay, we'll go great. ahead and get to those. I'll just read them out loud. Having published two books, what do you know now that you wish you had known before finishing your first book? Oh, uh, everything about publishing. Just kidding. I don't know anything about publishing. Um, I think uh, I actually just put this on TikTok the other day. So if you're one of the seven people who saw it, you, this is a repeat, but um, some advice I got, and it was from Jen DeLuca, who wrote the, the Well Met series um, from Berkeley, the Renaissance Fair stories, um, was that 99% of the time in publishing, it's not your turn. Um, I am a Leo. 
I like attention. <laughs> um, that's just that's how I roll. Um, but 99% of the time, it's not your book that people are paying attention to. Um, and I think that can be hard and people can take that personally initially in publishing because it's your book, baby. It's not just when it's your first one. And you're putting all this time and all this energy into it. And the publishing process is long. I think my book sold. So it was, it was done. It was pretty polished and it sold. It was still 18 months until it came out, um, which is on the long end, but not the longest end. Um, and so for 18 months, it's watching kind of other people's books be front and center and then wondering, hey, what about me? Um, but you know, then it is your turn and it's amazing. And you're in the glow of the sun and then it's not your turn again. You gotta wait again. But um, I do wish I had kind of had that advice and that framework when I got started because it does help give me context. When I have those moments of self-doubt, when I'm worried about it, I can just remind myself like, and I actually have it written right above my computer here. Like, it's not your turn right now. Um, it will be, it will be your turn. Your books will come out and I've got four this year. So I'll have more turns than I probably should. But um, that that's one thing. And I think the other thing I wish I knew sooner, and this is actually true of my academic writing and so many other things, but the, um, the only thing a first draft has to do is exist. And we get so into it, you know, it needs to be perfect. We try to polish it as we write. And some people like to write like that. But for so many things in our life, the first draft does not have to be perfect. The final draft won't be perfect. I will open that published book eventually and I will find a typo. I will find something I thought I changed four years ago. Um, like it's, you know, perfect is, is a myth. And so getting away from that idea that if it's not perfect, I shouldn't finish it. If it's not perfect, I shouldn't keep writing it. If it's not good yet, it won't be good ever. Um, and trying to kind of get over that mindset and in the empowerment program I talk about, or I lead, we actually talk about that kind of in life. Um, that it's okay to be imperfect at things. It's okay to grow, um, but to still do them, to still try, to still kind of risk wonder and risk, um, that risk averse thing I talked about. So those are probably the two main things I wish I had kind of known sooner. Um, that and that if you actually plot the book, it is faster to write. But, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I'm probably never going to do that. <laughs> well, that's great. I did not expect to learn so much this evening just for personal life with the myth of balance and perfection. I'm, I'm loving this. Um, I'm definitely going to be thinking about the things that I juggle, whether they're plastic or glass, for sure. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. <laughs> Um, a next question is when you overwrite, which I do a lot for the same reason as you needing that extra story, how do you slash and burn and figure out what to save? What questions do you ask yourself regarding if it serves the story? Oh, good question. Um, sometimes I can do it myself. I'm better at a line level with that. So cutting out a sentence here, um, you know, a section here, I have a harder time like cutting out like full chapters or full scenes. That for me is, is where my beta readers come in really helpful. And I have specific um, author friends who I send things to who I know are merciless. Um, and I'm actually one of those people for others. Like my, I mentored a new author whose book will be out next year. It's called The Art of Scandal. It's amazing. It's going to blow everybody's minds. It's like the good wife meets scandal meets like a telenovela. Anyway, um, that's coming out. But my co-mentor, um, she said of her, you are always there to just lift me up and keep me going and tell me I'm doing a great job. And Denise, you are really good at telling me I need to cut that. Um, and so I try to find that person for myself because they can be a little more merciless in saying, you don't need this. Because for me, I'm like, I love this scene. The Star Wars sex scene is so funny and it's so cute. And it totally is but there's a bunch of sex scenes in that book. Like it doesn't add anything new. It just gives me more Star Wars puns. And so somebody else for me is always a great thing. And when I send it to those specific beta readers, I actually ask them to mark things that feel extra or even just to mark sections that feel like they're dragging. And so if a section is dragging, that's where I go and look and see you know, where's maybe the fat I could cut out. What are we actually getting from this? And a few times I've had to go through and actually like diagram scene by scene, um, particularly with the fastest way to fall because I overwrote that so much. There was so much happening in subplots that I had to go through like scene by scene, chapter by chapter and look at what was the goal of this chapter and did it accomplish it and what did it leave you questioning? And if I couldn't do that, those were the ones I kind of flagged for, for cutting. But I also save absolutely everything I cut and sometimes if I don't use it in that book, I'll steal it and use it in a different book. 
Um, I'll, you know, rewrite it and and move it into something else. I might use it as bonus content. So I try to look at it as it's not like, it's not lost. I didn't waste those words, but oftentimes I have been able to pull something that I cut from one book and put it in something later, or even use it as a springboard for kind of a news story or something like that. So um, I, I try to do that. Even if I save it and never use it, I, st I still just save it and then I feel better about it. <laughs> No, that's fantastic advice. We've heard from aspiring writers before who um, talk about, oh, I, I just can't, I'm, I'm in love with this portion of the book. I can't possibly get rid of it. But I think with that mindset, like, well, let's put it away. Maybe you can use it later. It'll be a little bit easier to slash and burn. I'm also fairly, um, I'm a, um, I'm a checklist person. I wrote a whole book about it. So it probably doesn't surprise anybody. Um, but if you've taken like the Gallup Strengths Finder, like achievement is my number one. And so once I have a mission, I want to accomplish that mission. So um, with How to Fail at Flirting, when my agent said, I think we need to cut, you know, 15 to, I think she said 12 to 16,000 words or something. I cut 20. But once she gave me that mission and she gave me a little bit of framework, I can actually be pretty tough on myself. Like I'll be pretty merciless of killing my own darlings kind of once I have that mission. And I don't know, I don't know if that's a good character trait or a bad one, but it's like, I'm competitive with myself. And so then it really is, you know, I have to trim the word count. How can I go about that? And that for me is a little easier than when I'm just looking and being like, oh, what should I cut? What should I keep? Cause then I want to keep everything. But when I'm kind of mission driven, then it's a little easier for me. That's fantastic. And we have a comment in the chat too, that saving stuff was going to be a question. Um, and so using some sub stories, maybe spin it off later so that you, you don't lose it. So 100%. yeah. Another question is um, both of your books either tackle or touch on heavy subject matters and you encourage readers to take care of themselves as they read. If you're comfortable speaking on this, how do you take care of yourself while writing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think in some ways when I'm writing, okay, what I want to say is I kind of go into robot mode, which again, sounds like I'm a sociopath. Um, but I, I think I'm able to create some distance from some things for myself. Um, and like in, in the first story, again, it touches on um, domestic violence for folks who weren't here earlier. That is not my personal story that I've been, I, I've dated the narcissists and things like that, but never to the extent that Naya has, and I've never had to deal with that. Um, and so for that, a lot of that came from my, my readers, from some of my training. I have a, a degree in a counseling program and I work as kind of a, it, my work in college settings means I deal with a lot of students and what they're dealing with kind of in their lives. Um, and so I think in some ways for me, that was creating distance where I needed to, but it was also leaning into to empathy, to my own emotions, to my own experiences. In the fastest way to fall, a lot of British story is in my story. Um, and that wasn't even like I fictionalized it. Like I just straight up wrote like from my journal. Um, so the there's a story where she writes about an ex-boyfriend or an uh, the first boy who made her feel like she was undesirable. Um, and that's actually like word for word, straight out of my life. I actually wrote that and then sent it to the guy because we're still friends and said, hey, I'm going to put this in a book, <laughs> FYI. Uh, why don't you read it? If there's anything I need to change to like make it you know more distant from you, let me know. And we actually had this lovely like debriefing conversation about that moment. And so I guess some, there's some cathar catharsis sometimes, but I think I try, I try to lean into it and feel what the character's feeling. And, you know, sometimes that means laughing with the character and sometimes that means crying. And sometimes it means writing a little bit and then needing to step away from it. Um, but something that I really loved, and I think this was true in, in both books, but especially in, in the first book, is I think I also knew that I wanted to tackle heavy topics in an otherwise kind of fun, sexy, rom com -y type vibe, which is, a, which is a hard line to walk. I don't know if I did it well or not, but I did it um, because a lot of people don't get to see themselves in fun, fluffy love stories. And it's a lot of people who have been touched by trauma and the reality of being touched by trauma, living in trauma, and having those experiences is that you do actually still get to flirt with a stranger in a bar if you want to. You get to fall in love and you get to have great friends and you get to have great sex. Um, and you can have all of these moments, but it doesn't change that you've been touched by trauma. 
right? Like no matter how good the sex is, the penis is not a psychological healing device. The vagina isn't either or whatever other way you're going to have sex. Um, that's not like the function of those body parts. Um, and so, um, that doesn't change trauma. And so I wanted to try to show a realistic, a person living through that experience of falling in love and having this great time, but who was also having a realist experience with, with trauma and healing. And I've heard from so many people that that is their story and what it meant to see themselves on the page. And so while I was really not scared, but I didn't know how that was going to go with my first book, with my second book, I'd heard from those people already. And I still hear from those people a few times a week from one of the books, um, from either of the books rather, that, you know, that experience meant something to someone and it meant something to see their own struggles and their own healing and their own trauma on the page, but also like to see their own love story on a page. And I think that for me helps to write the harder stuff um, that are the heavier stuff because I know what that might mean to somebody. I mean, that said, my next book, as I already mentioned, is mostly about sex in an aquarium. So like, <laughs> I didn't go real heavy with that one just because that's not where the story was. Um, but I, I, I really like reading stories where you get the fun and the funny and the sexy and the love and the swoon. And you also get um, like workplace issues and, you know, other like heavy things going on. I like books like that. And so a lot of my books kind of touch on that. That was a longer answer than you were probably looking for, but um, yeah, so that, that's kind of where I go with that. Thank you. I hope that answered your question. Um, all right, the next follow-up question is, uh, who are some of your favorite romance authors? Oh, so many. Um, Kennedy Ryan is my OG favorite. If you haven't read Kennedy's books, they are beautiful. Like if if I could just like crawl into a book and live there, it would be one of Kennedy's books. And um, she is just prolific. She has a ton of books and um, three of her real just came out, which is uh, kind of flashes back between Harlem Renaissance and Hollywood today. And the, the cover is just gorgeous. It's, it's right here. I won't get up to grab it, but um, she also had Queen Move, um, which is very empowering, I think. And then before that, the um, All the King's Men duet, there's a the Kingmaker and the Rebel King. Um, there are like a billion trigger warnings on most of her books. So go read them and check them. Um, but that one is like high suspense, high heat. It looks at, um, it has an indigenous heroine. It looks at like land rights. It gets into politics. There's an explosion and a kidnapping. Um, it is, there's a lot of steam in that book. Um, but it is just one of my favorites. It keeps me on the edge of my seat. Like every time I listen to it or read it. Um, and so, yeah, I love Kennedy, um, Kennedy Ryan. For um, some lighter reads, I mentioned um, Jen DeLuca. I think her books are a lot of fun. I love Christina Lauren books. Um, there is, um, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking. Um, Fallon Ballard's uh, debut just came out a couple weeks ago. It's called Lease on Love. And it really like encapsulates, I think, like young millennial angst in just this beautiful, sexy little bubble. And I'm beyond that. I'm a couple decades beyond that. But um, it, it just fell in love with that book. I stayed up all night reading it. It's just lovely. And she's such a talented writer that um, her books are some of my go-tos. Um, so those are a few people. Cherish Reed, I love her books. And she has a new one coming out, a couple new ones coming out. And um, yeah, those are the first ones that come to mind. I'll have to add those authors' names to the video description too when you watch the recording back. We, we have people in the chat saying, yes, I love these people. <laughs> Great yes, authors. Right? They're so good. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, all right, here's the next question. Um, both of your books have couples that grapple with following their heart and the possibility that doing so may negatively affect their careers. Is this kind of forbidden taboo romance something that you're really drawn to in writing? Um, it, sometimes it is. That kind of taboo, yes. Like workplace, yes. Like stepbrothers, no, sometimes. Um, but um, I, I think I just, I love my job. I, I love my, my day job, my career. I love it as an author, but like my work is so important to me. And I work with college students and helping them to be successful and navigate through college and in and, and my research and all of that, like the work I do in my job is just so core and fundamental to like who I am and where I have found like so much value and growth personally. And so I think when I think about conflicts and think about losing something, 
other than like, you know, other than like love or family or something like that, I think about work because for me, that's just such an important thing. And that is pretty, um, pretty consistent with all of my characters. Like they love the work they do. They have passion for their job, whatever it is. Um, and someday I'm sure I'll write a character who hates their job, but I really haven't written that character yet. Like, and so when I just think about stakes, that is just always front of mind. And so I, I love the idea of like workplace conflict of love conflicting with work um, because those are so fundamental to so many of us, you know, family and love relationships. Like those are, are, are so much of how we move through the world. And then if we love our job too, you know, those, can you think of like two bigger things to come into conflict? And so as an author, maybe that's just a, a cheap, a cheap conflict to draw on, but I just, I really, um, I love the tensions that that brings up. And I actually teach a class on romance novels as tools for talking about social justice and feminism. And so we talk about that, like what it means in a romance novel context to look at career and what does it mean, particularly for a, a woman character to value her career over a relationship and what are some of the social pressures there and, and in all of those things. So I like to dig into that, but I'm trying to think of for all my novellas, I think for my novellas, they, they're not like in direct worry of losing their job. I don't think for any of them. So if that is like content that stresses you out, uh, the novellas, they touch on work, but it's not really a my job is in peril kind of story for any of those. They do still all love what they do though. I love that that's informing your writing, your love for your own job. Well, and two, you know, we spend so much of our life at our jobs, you know, I think, I feel like that's a natural <laughs> well to draw from. Yeah. Oh yeah. For sure. Um, oh, good. I'm glad this is a question about social media since we were talking about <laughs> your presence on social media too. Uh, I think your use of social media in the fastest way to fall was cleverly done. Um, how important was it to include social media and Britta's blog in the story? Great question. Um, I actually had my editor or my um, agent to thank for some of that, because in the initial draft, I think it was all a blog. It was all a blog. And she said, you know, what if you switch this up a little bit to make it a little more evergreen, a little more current um, to where, you know, where that would probably be done would be on social media. And so um, she kind of changed it up to that. But I, I loved that because I liked playing with the format. Like some of them could be you know, a transcript from a live or this is pre TikTok because I wrote this a while ago, but, um, you know, an Instagram post or maybe it's a tweet or something along those lines because we all kind of live on those different platforms. I don't know that it was important initially for me for it to specifically be social media, but once I got the idea to kind of have her to show like slices of her writing, um, that's something I added after my friends told me she was a robot and she didn't have personality um, because I liked being able to show the character kind of talking to her audience and have it not be about the hero because so much of her internal dialogue and, and the interactions is about the love story because that's what the book is about. But I really loved being able to show kind of her power as a writer and as a person. And that is really, I think if you haven't read the book yet, that's where you see a lot of her reflections about kind of this fitness process. It isn't really, you know, often in her head when she's with the hero or when she's doing these other things with her friends, but that's where she's a little more candid. Um, and so I loved how that turned out. Again, like many things, I didn't plan it. I kind of fell into it. Um, but one thing I do include in all my stories is, is social media is texting um, because that is just how we communicate. And so there is just like this giddy feeling when your crush text you. I mean, I'm married, so I don't talk about crushes anymore, but, uh, or it's my husband, he's my crush. Uh, but you know, when you get that text and it's something like flirty or funny, and it's just like that, like, oh, and I want to capture that in my books because that's how we communicate. Like, that's just how so many things happen now. Um, and so that's interesting to put in the context of books because it kind of, um, you know, stretches kind of what we do with social media. And that's a whole other discussion. But um, I, I like the idea of social media. And so I want to do that kind of in a future book where it fits, because I think that was kind of a fun, uh, a fun way to do epistolary and to think about like how we communicate. Yeah, that was very fun. And, you know, we all think about that moment when you're seeing those bubbles when someone's typing something back to you in the anticipation and then <laughs> it's like that it's like carly simon's yeah it's just all yep. that. <laughs> that's exactly right yes and we have a comment of course the social media and flirty texting were some of my favorite parts of the book oh, very real. yeah 
No, that's fantastic. Again, I do want to um, offer to the audience, if you do want to unmute yourself, turn on your video, you can talk directly to Denise. I don't have to read all of your comments. If you want to talk, feel free. You all have the capability to unmute, I made sure. <laughs> but if not, that's okay. We can still go back to other questions. It's okay. I hope everybody is in sweats with your glass of wine or your beverage of choice. <laughs> yeah, that is that is the benefit of having virtual programs. <laughs> you can just totally relax at home. It's quite lovely. I did. Well, my book came out in December of 2020, my first book, and my second book came out in November when things weren't great. Um, so I actually did my first in-person author event. Um, kind of, it was a signing. Um, it was still pretty distance, but actually tomorrow I have my first kind of real event and I'm like, oh man, I have to wear like pants. A dress. I mean, I am wearing pants for you all, but um, you know, like this is so interesting because I'm, you know, this far into my publishing journey. And this is the first time I've done like any of this because, you know, we, we were all virtual for everything when my first books came out. And so this is kind of exciting. It feels like it's I feel kind of like a new new baby author again. <laughs> yes. Oh, I love that. Well, and I have to say you are a fantastic speaker. So I'm sure your event tomorrow is going Thank to go you. really well. Thank you. My well, kid won't be there and there's going to be drinks. So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Mom's night out. <laughs> Well, I cannot believe that it is already eight o'clock. So we have actually filled up the time. Um, we have some people putting in the chat that it's been lovely talking to you, hearing from you. They've oh, really enjoyed you. it. Um, I know I did. I can't believe how quickly the time went by. Actually, um, this has been a fantastic discussion. All of our aspiring writers and authors, I'm sure, got so much from listening to your process as well. So, well, good thanks. luck to everybody who's writing and just, you know, keep writing, finish the draft and, and try, see what happens. <laughs> yes. And I know we definitely have a couple of people who are actually co-authoring something in the audience tonight and mentioned that. So that's fun. And that's a whole new style of writing too. <laughs> I've never done that. So that's exciting. Yeah. I love that. Oh, and you have converted someone who's not read a romance book before. They're going to read one now, <laughs> which I think is I fantastic. love it. I think the Fast Fate of Falls may be a good entry point. It's not like too steamy or anything. It's a slow burn, but welcome to romance. It sucks you in. Yes, yes. And so, of course, check out her books at denisewilliamswrites.com. Um, and if you want to try out a book first before you purchase, you can do that at the library as well, greenvillelibrary.org. You can put any of these items on hold. They are popular, so there is a small wait list. <laughs> so you do need to get your name on the list. Um, but thank you all so much for attending. Thank you, Denise, for sharing your time. Um, we know you have a very busy schedule, so we so appreciate you taking the time out of your day to talk to us here. Thank you all so much for having me and have a great night and a good weekend. Yes, thank you. As always, if you want to catch more events like this, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, we'll put that um, in the recording notes and then a slide as well. You can see that. And um, check out our website, greenvillelibrary.org slash events. So you can make sure that you register for other fun author events. We've got some coming up. You don't want to miss those. And of course, don't forget, winter reading is happening. You have until March 15th to complete that and earn some prizes. So thank you all for joining us this evening. Again, thank you, Denise. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at another virtual event soon. Happy reading.